This is our first online lecture, online lecture one, Networks and History of the Internet. We're going to start with a historical overview of internet history, looking uh, back from the end of World War II up to present day to see what actually occurred that led up to the modern day internet. Now at the end of World War II, uh, if you recall your history, in 1945 the war with Japan uh, ended when the atomic bomb was dropped on Nagasaki and Japan surrendered. And a number of uh, historically significant things happened here leading up to the internet. First of all, uh, the nuclear arms race began uh, after that first uh, or that second uh, atomic bomb was dropped that led to the end of the war. And that nuclear arms race went on all the way till 1990 and played a big part in uh, the development of the internet. Along this timeline, uh, actually the first thing that happened was the uh, USSR, uh, that was uh, Soviet Russia, actually detonated their first atomic bomb in 1949, just four years after uh, the Nagasaki bomb. Shortly after that, 1952, the United States detonated the first hydrogen bomb. Now that is a much larger version of an atomic bomb, much more powerful. And a few years later, the Soviet Union also developed their first hydrogen bomb. By 1982, both our countries, uh, U.S. and uh, Soviet Union, possessed over 10,000 warheads each. And by 1990, uh, there was finally a conventional forces uh, treaty in Europe that began nuclear disarmament. Another factor uh, in World War II as well, when Germany surrendered, uh, they had quite a few uh, scientists that were working on their rocket technology. Now, Germany had developed the most advanced rocket technology uh, of the century, and their scientists were sought by both the United States and uh, Soviet Russia. So uh, when Germany surrendered, if you recall your history, they were actually attacked from two sides, uh, Russia from one side, the United States and the Allied troops from the other. So both countries captured these rocket scientists. Now, USSR actually got the first man-made object in the space, and that was the Sputnik satellite. This is very significant in the uh, development of the Internet. They also got the first human in the space in 1961. Now keep in mind the United States had been working on these same goals uh, at the same time, but uh, Russia was quite a ways ahead of us in technology as far as uh, space technology. Finally, in 1969, the uh, United States had a first by landing on the moon uh, with the Apollo mission. And by 1975, uh, actually, there was the Apollo-Soyuz missions where the U.S. and USSR were cooperating, uh, linking uh, ships together in orbit, which eventually led up to the International Space Station. So how did this lead up to the present-day Internet? An uh, agency called ARPA, Advanced Research Projects Agency, was created by the United States government, and primarily they were created as a result of that first satellite that went in the orbit called Sputnik in 1957. When the Russians put that satellite in the orbit, they actually caused a panic in the United States. It was a very harmless satellite. It was about the size of a large basketball with some antennas on it. All it could do is send a, a signal 
that they could track it with. But uh, because we were in the middle of an arms race, many people in the United States believed that that satellite actually contained an uh, atomic bomb. And it was, in fact, visible over certain parts of the United States. Uh, if you could see it at the right time at night, uh, it was uh, shiny enough that it actually could be seen orbiting. So that basically created a panic. Ultimately led up to the creation of ARPA. One of the things that ARPA did, and these are all now very important to the Internet, is they began to establish certain uh, standards and codes that are still used today. The first one was the ASCII code, which is actually the computer alphabet. Later on, they began to uh, develop network schemes that uh, currently are used by our networks today. In 1969, an actual network message was sent from UCLA to Stanford colleges. The email standard user at host that we are still using today was established in 1972 by ARPA. And network protocols, which we'll talk a little bit more about later, uh, were established in 1973. The first real internet called ARPANET became operational in 1975. So actually, we had an internet in 1975, although very few people had access to it. By 1979, there were over 100 domains, but again, very few people even knew that there was an internet. Mostly government and some colleges were using it. In 1984, the ARPANET divided into both military and civil networks. And finally, in uh, the National Science Foundation, NSF, created a internet called the NSF Net, which was the beginnings of the modern day internet. The old ARPANET was officially decommissioned in 1990. And the Gore Bill passed, which allowed the modern internet to begin approximately 1991. Al Gore at the time was the vice president and uh, at the time also tried to take credit for creating the internet. But as you can see, it had been around for quite some time. So to summarize about ARPA, uh, first of all, ARPA stands for Advanced Research Projects Agency. It was created in 1958 by the Department of Defense after the Soviet Union launched the uh, first orbital satellite, Luminous Sputnik. They were charged with getting the U.S. ahead of Soviet technology. Their primary focus was defense-related technology. Also, NASA was created, uh, created in the same year as ARPA. And later on, it was renamed DARPA for Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. So now to summarize the technical advances which were created by ARPA. First of all, ARPA established a standard ASCII code that provides the uh, binary character codes which computers still use today. Also, they established the physical and logical network schemas that are still in use today, and those are the actual physical uh, hardware requirements as well as the uh, connections and all the devices that we use to make networks operate properly. Uh, they also developed something called packet switching, which is a type of distributed computing that we still use. They established the user at host email protocol, which is, of course, should be quite familiar to you again, still in use. They established network protocols, still in use today as well, TCEPIP, which is used for internet and networks, FTP, which is used for transferring files. And they created ultimately ARPANET, which is the first actual internet, although generally it was not available to the public. We're going to talk a little bit more about this idea of packets and packet switching. Uh, 
Packets are actually small digital envelopes which contain uh, pieces of a larger electronic document. Information travels through networks and the internet in the form of packets or these digital envelopes. And each packet has to have its integrity checked when it arrives at its destination computer. And if it's damaged, the receiving device will request a new copy from the sending device. This is referred to as packet loss or packet errors. When all the packets are received, the document is reassembled by the receiving computer. This entire process commonly will take from 20 to 300 milliseconds depending on the speed of your internet connection. So we also have mentioned something called protocols and these are related to packet switching. Network protocols are basically common rules that govern the transfer of information over networks or the internet. They were created originally by ARPA in the 1970s. Protocols uh, still in use today are TCP, Transmission Control Protocol, used for networks, IP, Internet Protocol, used for Internet communications, FTP, File Transfer Protocol, used to transfer files over the Internet, and the last uh, ones are POP, IMAP, and SMTP, which are all email protocols. Now, not all of those were developed originally in the 70s. Uh, POP was, but the others were uh, developed later on. Okay, we're going to summarize now how ARPANET eventually led to the modern Internet. So, 1975 is when ARPANET became operational. In 1881, the NSF, National Science Foundation, started CSNet, and that was an early type of public internet. In 1984, ARPANET was divided into a civilian and military components. In 1986, based on CSNet, the NSF uh, started a broader purpose network called NSFNet connected to ARPANET. By 1990, ARPANET was no longer needed as a prototype and decommissioned. NSFNet development went out to bid for funding and eventually became a, uh, a for-profit organization. And in 1991, government funding was also approved through a bill called the Gore Bill, and the modern internet was born. Soon after, Netscape and AOL began to offer up dial-up internet access uh, to the general public. And uh, again, we remember uh, Al Gore, the vice president was uh, at the time tried to take credit for the uh, creation of the internet, but as we know, the internet existed as early as 1975. For the second half of this lecture now, we're going to take a look at some of the basics regarding uh, networks. So a little bit about networks. First of all, networks, generally speaking, are the means to link computer systems or other networks together. The Internet is considered to be a network. Most homes and businesses have some type of network in place. Cell phones use networks. Networks can be hardwired or wireless. Many devices, including cell phones, also use Bluetooth, which is a short-range network. And networks are comprised of five basic components. Components of networks. There are five basic networking components. The first component is the message. The next component is the sender, and then the receiver, the transmission medium, and the protocol. The message has the information to be sent. The sender is a device used to send the message. The receiver is a device used to receive the message. 
The transmission medium is how the message is sent, and the protocol is the format used to send the message. Now, I'm sure everyone has heard of this thing called the cloud. The cloud is just a metaphor that refers to storing or accessing data and programs over the internet instead of your computer's hard drive. Uh, the term the cloud also can refer to the internet itself. Users can send the file to a data server by a cloud provider instead, or as well as storing it on their own computers. This has the advantage of allowing you to access all of your files you have stored on the cloud from any internet-enabled device such as your phone, tablets, and laptops. The advantage of using cloud data to back up important files is that you have a reliable way to ensure that the data is not lost due to computer hardware fails, failures or theft or damage from computer viruses. Google Drive and Microsoft OneDrive are common examples of cloud data storage. Now let's take a look at how data flows over the internet, starting with a descending device, which would be your laptop or other device, and it's going to be connected to some sort of a router or routing device. And from that router, it goes to what is called an ISP or Internet Service Provider. And this is referred to as a Tier 3 NSP. When we get to the Internet, then, these Internet Service Providers are connected to, through the Internet, uh, Tier 1 or Tier 2 Internet Service Providers. And through those, they're all connected with something called an IXP, which is an Internet Exchange Point. And then the Internet Service Provider for whatever web server you're trying to contact is connected on the other end. And for data transmission mediums, we have currently wire, which is copper wire fiber optic which uses fiber optic cables with laser beams and satellites which is basically a type of wireless communication uh, with in-orbit satellites data transmission of course is done with packets which we talked about before and the protocols are tcp ip which is the standard internet and network protocol used worldwide Now let's talk about something uh, called network categories. Uh, the first category we're going to talk about is called a LAN or local area network. You've probably heard of these. Uh, you are working on a LAN in the school, as a matter of fact, and that is a network that is connected uh, usually through a routing device to a server that is somewhere in the building. Local area networks are very common in both businesses and schools and uh, other places where uh, computer labs exist. Your home may also have a form of a local area network in the sense that it has one or more computers connected uh, either through wires or wirelessly to a router which goes to your internet service provider. The next type of network is called a wide area network or WAN. That is basically multiple LANs or local area networks which are connected uh, through phone lines or some other type of internet technology. An example of a wide area network would be KVCC's network which is spread over multiple buildings uh, in the same city. Uh, the third type of network we're going to talk about is something you may not have heard of. It's called a Metropolitan Area Network, or MAN. And that is uh, similar to a wide area network, but specifically 
uh, set to a metropolitan area. Uh, the idea being that an entire city may have a metropolitan network that is spread across its entire area. Again, not something you uh, hear very often, but uh, be aware that this type of network does exist. Uh, the last type of network is called a global area network, or GAN, and that is basically the Internet itself. So there is only one global network. We're also going to talk a little bit about secure networks. E-business has been around uh, really since the Internet began in the 90s. And that, of course, is Internet-based business. And as it's grown over the years, it really became necessary to get some sort of affordable technology to provide secure network communications. This technology is called uh, VPN, or Virtual Private Network. A VPN uses a uh, special type of software to create a private channel over existing internet pathways uh, using a VPN server. Uh, this is uh, inexpensive and software-based technology that now allows businesses to conduct secure private transactions over the internet, and many individuals use VPNs as well in their homes uh, to keep their internet usage uh, private. This is basically how VPNs work. So you have your computer, and it's connected to the Internet. But in this case, between your computer and the Internet is a VPN server. That VPN server acts uh, as an intermediary between you and the Internet. So you will send information to the server, which is encrypted the server takes that request and goes out to the public internet and gets the information for you and returns it to your computer. So anyone out on the internet is not able to see where that VPN server is getting or sending its data, effectively making your computer invisible to the public internet. Okay, we have just a few more terms to go over. Uh, other internet technologies, uh, one of these is called an intranet. An intranet is uh, when computers within a single company or building are connected using web technologies. Uh, the last uh, term we're looking at is something called an extranet, and that's similar to an intranet except it is businesses or other buildings being linked together through, again, internet and VPN technology. This is called an extranet. This concludes our online lecture number one. Next week will be online lecture two, browsing the web. For this week, remember to complete the two assignments. The first one is after watching this lecture, uh, finish the quiz on Moodle. And second, there is a forum that you are required to participate in regarding uh, this lecture.